Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Our passage today is a Sunday school classic in many ways. Most of us, and I include myself in this, we've learned this parable when we were in Sunday school. And why not? This is a very image heavy parable. It's a great story. Even a child can grasp what Jesus is trying to tell. And that's certainly something that Jesus would have wanted when he was telling the parable, something he had on his mind. But now that we are adults, we have to move from the milk to the meat, as Paul would put it. And I think it's time that we chew on the parable that Jesus has just taught us. It's a fitting passage, a fitting parable, as we remember Pentecost, the harvest time for the souls of the world. This parable would be something that his audience could connect with. They saw that the grain that was sown on the road, that accidentally landed on the road, would be consumed by the birds as quickly as they could. They would see that any of the grain that landed on rocky soil would perish from the heat. They would see thorns and thistles kill crops that didn't have the field cleared of them. Jesus interprets this parable for his disciples, a, a, an interpretation that Matthew passes on to us. The soil represents the hearer. The birds represent Satan. The heat represents persecution and hard times. And the thorns represent the worries and distractions of this age. Like all parables of Jesus, it makes sense after he explains it to us. And through this parable, we see how the gospel can take root in a person's life. And we also see sometimes how it doesn't. We see the birds cons consuming the seed of the word. And this is what happens when someone whose heart is not ready to hear the gospel doesn't receive the gospel. It bounces off. And the birds, in this case Satan, will use the opportunity to seize the message and the hope of the gospel. The message of the kingdom of God. These are hearts that are so hard that the word cannot enter. And when Satan steals it, the sown seed is wasted. In the case of the rocky soil, Galilee had this unfortunate problem where sometimes the soil was really close to the bedrock. And because of that, any plant that grew in rocky soil would look like it was about to grow and be a fruitful crop. But when the heat came, the plant would dry up and it would die in the sweltering heat of the Middle Eastern sun. As Jesus explains, this rocky soil represents those who are willing, they're joyous to hear the, the kingdom of God is at hand and they're willing to accept the gospel, but they do not have the space to develop the deep roots, the deep roots of lived faith. And as such, the gospel cannot grow within them. The gospel perishes. The seed of the word dries up from the hammering heat of the hard times. In the third soil, there's nothing wrong with the soil. The soil is not rocky. It's been plowed. There's no problem with the soil. But the seeds have to compete with the weeds. The soil represents those who are willing to accept the gospel, who have the right soil, but they have other things that distract them from this life. Things that choke out the message of the kingdom of heaven. To put it in theological terms, the soil represents one of the greatest perils to Christian life, the peril of idolatry. And by idolatry, we don't just mean the worship of the Greek gods or the Egyptian gods or the Norse gods, but in a sense to what they were supposed to represent. I'm talking about idolatry in a far more simpler sense. The idolatry of the things that take us away from having the gospel in God as the central focus of our lives. And what distracts us from it isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes it's as simple as the wealth that we need for security, wisdom, power to do good, healing, or even something as simple as love. These things are good in and of themselves. And they're important things to be pursued. But when they don't have their right place, when they take the place of God, to use a phrase from Tim Keller, when they are our counterfeit God, they take a twisted form. And they become the distractions in our lives. And they choke out 
the seed that's in us, that's trying to grow in this fertile soil. Jesus tells the disciples about these different types of people in the parable. But if we meditate on the passage, if we think on it, if we chew on it, we realize that it's not just limited to different types of people. It also represents the different states of our own hearts. We do not always accept the seed of God's word in our hearts. We do not understand God's message, the hope of the gospel, and Satan is more than happy to snatch the gospel away from us, to snatch that hope from us. There are times when we are willing to accept the gospel, but we do not have the right soil to develop the deep roots, the roots that help us keep our faith when the tough times come. Sometimes it's not a problem of developing deep roots, but of what else grows in our lives, the things that distract us. And sometimes our soil is just right. Sometimes it's loose enough, sometimes it's deep enough, and there are no, there's nothing that distracts us. And it allows us to produce a fruit 30, 60, or even 100-fold. And obviously that is the soil that we all should aim for. So why does Jesus teach us this parable? Jesus is cautioning his disciples, and obviously even us. He's letting us know that wherever the gospel is preached, there will be obstacles. The world will place obstacles. It'll place obstacles with Satan trying to steal the hope of the gospel, the message of the gospel from us. It will be there when tough times come. And it'll be there in the form of distractions for us. Sometimes the problem is not with the external things, but with the internal. Sometimes our hearts are not ready to receive the gospel. Or they are ready, but they've not been dug deep enough. But when all the conditions are right, this word of God can produce a bountiful crop, a crop that reminds us that in Christ, we are more than champions. He tells us this parable to remind us that the hope of the gospel is not a vain hope. It is a hope that produces its own fruit. From this parable also comes the question for us. What is our soil? Are we the soil that doesn't allow the gospel to come in? Are we the rocky soil that accepts the gospel, but does, it does not have the necessary space to develop the, the roots? Are we the soil that doesn't have its weeds and thorns and thistles cleared? Or are we the good soil where the gospel can take root and despite the heat, we can develop deep roots and produce a bounteous yield? The answer at times can be very complicated for us. There are times when the gospel has bounced off of us and it's quickly snatched by Satan. We see it whenever we refuse to let the gospel change us. And in the process, the hope and the fruit of the gospel is stolen by Satan, who is our accuser, our prosecutor, our persecutor. There are times we welcome the message. We welcome it gladly. But then the gospel has trouble staying in us. It fails to grow within us because we do not have the roots to develop our faith. We do not grow in our faith. We cannot answer Jesus' call. Hold the fort for I am coming. We have trouble waving the answer back to heaven saying, by your grace we will. There are times when the problem is that it's not that we cannot grow things in our hearts. It's that there are distractions. There are things that take us away from the gospel that have the wrong place in our hearts. They consume our attention completely and then the gospel dies. For our soil to be the right soil, it needs the help of someone to till the soil, to make sure it's loose, to make sure it's deep, to clear the weeds. But who does this? Who tills the soils of our hearts? Who removes the weeds? Who makes sure it's deep? For this, we need to actually look back to Matthew chapter 12. There is a repeated emphasis in that chapter on the role of the Holy Spirit in, one, in whatever Jesus does and in whatever he teaches to the people. And it's fitting that we remember this role, that we consider this role of the Holy Spirit as we remember Pentecost. For it was the Spirit 
that initiated Pentecost for us, that began the explosion of the church. It is the Holy Spirit as part of the triune God who works on the soil of our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit who prepares the soil, allowing us to receive the gospel and to internalize it. It is the Spirit that digs deep within us, breaking the rocks so that we can develop the roots and stand firm in times of trial. It is the Spirit that clears away the weeds that allows us to grow our fruit. So the question is, what can we do and what should we do? How do we ensure that our hearts are the good soil, where the fruit of the word can multiply? There is one answer, and only one answer. We ask that the Holy Spirit act on us. We ask that the Spirit may change us. We surrender our hearts to him with all our flaws and our strengths, and we ask that he do this continually. Because this is not a one-off thing. This is not just something that happens once. This ha has to happen continually. Because as anyone who's been near a farm knows, if you don't take care of that ground continuously, eventually it'll be like the very first ground where the gospel cannot even enter. We ask that he makes our hearts the good soil. We even have a hymn for that prayer. Lord, let my heart be good soil, open to the seed of your word. Lord, let my heart be good soil, where love can grow and peace is understood. When my heart is hard, break the stone away. When my heart is cold, warm it with the day. When my heart is lost, lead me on your way. Lord, let my heart be good soil. By God's grace, we become the good soil. We can ask the Spirit to lead us into a life of faith, a life that's actually exemplified by our psalm today. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. Our psalm today, the passage ends with this. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Amen. This prayer is what the life of faith looks like when it's lived out. When we follow God's words and his commandments out of love for him, out of a joy for wanting to do what pleases him. It is a life that's guided by his word the light for us in our thoughts, in our actions, in all that we do. It's a life that's guided through prayer. It's a life that's exemplified through praise and worship. It's a life that is tested through fasting. It is a life that gives through charitable giving. We live this life by walking as Jesus taught us to walk. A life where we reflect the gospel, a life that's filled with the fruit of the Spirit, a life that is full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. This is a life against which there is no law. By God's grace, we grow the seed of the word into a crop that yields a thousand times even. It's by God's grace that we can then tell everyone else about the good news. As that old Christmas hymn says, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And in the same way, we can go and tell others, the kingdom of God is at hand. Rejoice. Rejoice. For the hope of the gospel, the hope of Christ has come. And if we hold on, we can hold the fort till Jesus comes again in glory. And he tells us, you are the good soil that produced fruit. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's rest. Let's pray to live this life of faith. A life that's lived out of a love for God and for our neighbor. A life that is filled with the joy of wanting to follow the commandments. A life that is faithful to his promise.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to read one of your teachings. Allow us, Lord, as we go through today, to chew on what we have heard. Allow us to seek your help, to seek your guidance, to seek your grace, to make our hearts the good soil. We know we cannot do this of our own effort. We need your help. We need your work in our lives every day. We ask all of these things in your name. Amen.